Hello everyone and welcome back. It's another day of geometric adventures. Uh, I think I got, yes, I got my Princeton shirt on, a different Princeton shirt on. Um, I got a lot of these shirts. We are uh, fans of Princeton squash in particular, but that's not the topic of today's discussion. We will be talking about the last etude that was not covered in the previous video because we went 30 minutes last time. And I'd like to keep it to around 30 minutes just for consistency's sake. So here's the situation that we did not do yet in GeoGebra. Remember we uh, ended last time with this modern Mueller Breslau method for the simply supported beam. Now we will be looking at the fixed ended beam known as a cantilever where it's free at the end. We'll put a cut on the beam somewhere. Then we'll put a point where the load starts and a point where the load ends. And that will be a uniformly distributed load, a force per length a force per length. Then we'll have the cut maybe inside of that distributed load as it is in this slide, or perhaps outside of the load, and we'll see what happens. So we are not hardwiring things. Everything is parametric. This is the way I will do it graphically. It's actually not necessary to do all of these steps because all you need is the centroid which will be the midpoint between load start and cut and the midpoint between cut and load end. So that's really all you need. But for beautiful drawings, we will draw some quadrilaterals here. And then we will ask the robot to find the centroid. Obviously, it's at the midpoint, but it's nice to employ this technique. So here are the two centroids, and then we will perturb the beam uh, due to the cut, and we will be looking for the internal equilibrating moment. The, that will be a circle centered on cut. Uh, we'll move the cut to make sure everything's working, and then we will establish the lofts. And notice if the beam is not moving, there's no loft. And then we will apply uh, the final equation for a large perturbation and then for a small perturbation. Okay, so let's do it. Let's, let's have fun. Obviously, there's lots of different ways of doing this. I will show you my preferred workflow. I like that word. You know I like that word. So I will open up from scratch like we like to do. Our robot uh, obviously changed the font so you could see it. Turn off the labeling on the new objects. Close the algebra window. Reopen the algebra window. We're almost done with the whole etude. I like to say left is at zero, zero. Just hardwire that. That's the only thing you really want to hardwire. And it's so hardwired that I will right click on it, object properties, and I will fix that object. So I won't accidentally move it, which I've done many, many times. Span could be anything, 20, 21, 22, doesn't matter. Remember, you are responsible for the units. We are also very conspicuously placing products here today. When they start giving me money, I'll say who they are. I like to say right is left plus the X coordinate being the span, the Y coordinate being zero. If you don't like that, you don't have to do it. A big fat blue beam for our beam. Ooh. Don't you wish life had a control Z? Do you want to make the bricks? 
Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Uh, notice I'm going to just drop the polygon. I'm not even going to put the points down there. I'm just going to drop the polygon. I have the grid on, so I could snap to lines on the grid. It looks great. Anything is fine. Anything is fine. Right click on that. Object properties under the color. It should be green. Our boundary conditions are green. And our style should be bricks, the famous <laughs> zero degree bricks, okay? Looking good. Then hide those points. You don't want those. All right. Hide the grid. Hide the axes. We are almost done. You could change that to a, a different point if you want. I like to have it there because sometimes you need to center a circle on the left, but don't display it forever. After you're sort of done, hide it because you don't want someone to think it's an internal hinge. Let's put a cut on the beam. I like to have red X's for my cuts, you know, fairly prominent. You could do snap to object or you could just wait for the finger to show up. Rename it as cut by right clicking. That's sweet. Make sure it's glued on. Everything looked great. Now uh, we need a load start and a load end. I like to put the diamonds on there. Red is for loads, green is for boundary conditions. So I like to put the diamonds on there. They don't have to be really big. Put a diamond, oops, put a diamond here. And a diamond here, so it doesn't really matter where. Rename by right clicking load point one. We always start with a capital letter and everything is case sensitive. So I like separating English words with capital letters truncated as names of variables in all of my scripts. That's good coding practice. Okay, make sure it's glued on. Everything looks perfectly glued. Now I think it's worth doing these beautiful quadrilaterals just because they're beautiful but you don't have to do it. But you do want a quadrilateral to the left of the cut and a quadrilateral to the right of the cut. That is absolutely 100% critical. You don't take the centroid of the entire load. You don't draw one quadrilateral from load point one to load point two because the Mueller-Breslau method, the modern method and the classic method both require that if there's a kink in the structure, and load is distributed over that kink, you must break the load up in proportion to how it's distributed on either side of the kink. That's a long rule, but it's crystal clear why you have to have that rule. I just arbitrarily will draw a, a vertical lines here. Doesn't really matter um, how you do this. So I'm taking the beam and I'm saying, give me a vertical line there. Give me a vertical line there. I will drop two points here. It doesn't matter how big they are. They will be the quad. They will be the depth of the quad. <clears throat> and one more line at the cut. Now perpendicular lines shooting across will establish the two quadrilaterals. I need to find the intersecting points. Use intersect, don't drop a point there. That's really bad practice. Just use intersect. How easy is that? Click, 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 click. Okay, uh, you can hide the lines uh, now or later. I like to use the polygon. The regular polygon is something that is symmetric. You could explore it later. Uh, we rarely use it, almost never use it. Just the regular old polygon, go around. It doesn't matter if you go clockwise or counterclockwise, just end where you started. 
now I like to hide my lines. Make sure you sort all of these objects by the object type. Way better technique. Hide the lines. Uh, hide these points. You could actually hide all of the points at this point, except for the cut. But it's nice to have load point one and load point two out there so that you see how the load can be varied parametrically. Okay, so everything looks great. <clears throat> this is just a visual representation. It doesn't do anything mathematically at all. So let's make it a little more visual. Uh, touching both of these by holding the control button, right-clicking, object properties, color should be red, it's a force. Style, I like the uh, hatching. It's a little further down the list. 90 degree hatching, fairly coarsely spaced. Uh, no need to make it super finely spaced like that, but it's up to you. It's just aesthetics, it doesn't matter. Whatever is fine. Now we need the centroids of these individual quadrilaterals, and they are called Q2 and Q3. You could see them right here. You could rename them, but it's not worth it. This name is nice to have, though. I like to call them with a capital C. So C1 is the centroid of Q1. Oops. Oops, of, of Q1. Oops, uh, I was looking for it on my uh, load and it ended up in my wall. So this is a good example of a teaching moment. That's what they teach us in teacher school. Double click on it, don't delete it. Double click on it and change it, change your error. I just said it was Q2 and Q3, but I typed in Q1. There's. There is the centroid of the first quadrilateral, and C2 will be the centroid of the next quadrilateral. <laughs> I did that wrong again. Uh, I, I know why I'm doing it wrong, because it's C2, uh, Q3, but that's hopefully obvious to everybody in the room. Very good. Now, We could draw the big arrows. That's a great idea, I think, uh, to draw the arrows. It looks really good. Technically, you don't need it, um, but maybe we'll draw it now since we're on a roll here in terms of aesthetics. Uh, the first thing that we need is a force distribution magnitude. So <laughs> a magnitude of the force per length. Is it 100? pounds per foot or 3,000 kilonewtons per meter. And I don't like the way you transcribe kilonewtons, Mr. Robot. You know what I mean. Let's say, uh, I like to say PLF. If you're not in the United States or Rwanda, you won't know what that means, but it's pounds per linear foot. Uh, I like to say that it doesn't matter what it is, 275 or something. And then F1, what is the magnitude of the first force left of the cut? That is the force per length times the distance of the distribution. So F1 is the force per length, which I just defined as PLF. Now it's blue, times what? times the x distance of the cut point minus the x distance of the load point one. Do you see that? The x distance of the cut point minus the x distance of load point one. you'll have a different number based on your geometry where, and depending on where your cut is. If the cut is all the way at the end, it should be all of the load, right? Um, the next portion of that load is F2, and that would be F2 is equal to, can you do this with me? It is, you're so good. 
PLF multiplied by the X coordinate of load point two minus the X coordinate of the cut. The spaces do not matter for the robot. Uh, I just like it when I'm programming because it's easier to um, debug, right? Now uh, we can put a line at the centroid on the blue beam. We really do need that. So let's say perpendicular line to the beam through that centroid and then find the other intersection points. So here to here, here to here. We really need that. The other one is just for show. Let's leave the lines for now because I want to put in a four scale. And if you don't want to use a slider, you don't have to use a slider. The sliders kind of drive me nuts sometimes. F scale is, let's just say two times F2, right? Uh, something like that. I don't really like that. The scale, the slider is much easier but I'll just show you how this works because I know at least one of you is saying, I still don't get that scale factor. Circle, center, and radius. There's the center. The radius is not F1. F1 is thousands and thousands of units. And there's no units in GeoGebra. It would make it thousands of lengths, right? So we divide by F scale. And here's where the slider doesn't really work too well because uh, the lack of a slider doesn't really work too well because now I have to start guessing, you know, how big should that be, right? Um, and so I think the slider is the way to go, but let's just leave it for now here. Uh, find an intersect. We need 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Hide 6 o'clock. Draw a big red arrow downwards to describe that force. Hide 12 o'clock, hide the circle, hide the line, even hide that centroid thing. You really need the mark on the beam. That's absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. We won't draw the perturbed load. It's just a little too fussy. All right, one more time. Circle, center, and radius. It will be F2 divided by the scale factor. Find the intersects. Ah. Hide six o'clock. No. Ah. Hide six o'clock. <laughs> The slider is way better. I'm going to use the slider next time. Next time I teach this course, it's going to be great. Uh, hide the circle. Hide the line. Big fat red arrow. Hide 12 o'clock. Hide the centroid. We are really, really beautiful. Self-congratulate. At this point, I'm even going to hide this. I don't like that. You're going to get really fussy with this. I guarantee you, you will get so fussy. You'll be fussier than me. And I'm pretty fussy with this. Oh, my cut. Look, look, look. All this little fussiness. My cut should have been black. I don't know how I changed that accidentally. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So... Don't hide these dots, though, that demarcate where the load is actually on the beam. Now, we are seeking the internal moment, so we want to perturb the beam in terms of rotation. The quickest way I think of doing this is to draw a circle that is centered on cut that snaps through the free tip. Just do that. So you don't have to measure it. You don't have to calculate anything. Just use this snapping feature right here. Circle with center through point. Center through point. What could be easier? It's just so nice. Big fat, um, sorry, uh, a dot first. 
a dot. I don't, uh, I'm so fussy. Should be black. I'll change that next time. I'm going to make this dashed so we know it's perturbed. I don't like that either. I'm actually going to hide it. I will make a new dash this way, a, a segment from left. Now I'm just being precocious. And then I will make a dashed line here. Ugh. My evaluations are going down. All right, now the big solid perturbed line. Ooh, that looks nice. Okay, now we could do delta as the angle. Um, the angle button is in here, right? It's angle, select three points or two lines. I always select three points and I usually get the order wrong, but I've done this one so many times that I know the order on this one. If your order is wrong, you'll get the exterior angle. If your order is correct, you will get the interior angle. And if your order is wrong, just go the other way. So what do I mean by that? This is the wrong direction, here to here to here. I get that external one. So just stop, don't even do it. Go here, this way. And I don't want the actual number. First of all, I wanna rename that. So I will rename that to be everybody together. You're so good, Delta. And then when I touch it, there's a drop down object property in here. Just give me the name. Isn't that sweet? I don't need the number. And I certainly don't want degrees. Those drunken sailors. Um, now, I need, where is the red arrow on the perturbed beam? So certainly left of the cut, there is no perturbation. Right of the cut, where is the perturbation? Let me zoom in here. Right of the cut, where is that perturbation? Can you see it? Can you think of a really clever way that is super fast of finding where that perturbation is on the perturb, excuse me, where that load point is, excuse me, where that centroid of the load right of the cut, where is that application point on the perturbed beam? Now notice how fussy I was with all my language. Engineers are fussy with our language, especially when we're coding, because load point means something. It means this to me as a programmer, right? And I'm not a programmer at all. I'm a poser. All right. All right. I'm going to show you my way of doing it, which you should become your way of doing it. Circle with center through point. There's the center. There's the point. What could be easier than that? Just go find this intersection. Click, click. We are done with that <clears throat> and hide the circle. Now, all I need is the vertical distance. You can draw a segment. Yes, you can, just like this, which is really nice for presentations when you're, when you're making a speech in front of thousands of people. These look great, but there's just a lot of clicking, clicking, clicking. See, you know exactly what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to find that intersect. I'm going to hide all these lines. I'm going to draw a green line. And that green line will be the vertical loft. And I'll call that loft two segment loft to segment because I think that looks great. It's in the book. Uh, I love it, except there's a lot of click, 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 click. And I kind of like the other way pretty quickly too. Uh, now you could, now the other way, <clears throat> the problem, well, it's an opportunity. We don't have problems in engineering. We just have opportunities. 
For those of you who have a little bit of programming skills, I think you might know where I'm headed with the next statement. I can program loft two as y of one point minus the y of the other point. I can also ensure that the sign is respected. So I can say it's y of the lower point minus y of the upper point, and then I could use equation one with a positive sign. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, don't worry too, too much. Uh, the segment approach is a scalar. That's your loft, but then you have to make some decisions about the signs, right? So I actually prefer the latter version. Uh, let me just show you what I mean here, because I hope this all makes sense to you. I'm going to call it loft two um, version one is y of that point, the one on the beam, that's L minus R, y of L minus y of R. And then I'm going to say loft two version two is y of R minus y of L. Now, obviously there's just a sign difference, but it is a negative loft. So if you were programming this strictly as a programmer, uh, loft two version two would be your default choice. And then you would program the fundamental equation unknown times delta plus fi loft i equals zero. So you're assuming that it is um, a direction, right? A magnitude. And then you have to do one more programming step of saying, okay, well, I got to solve for um, the unknown, which is minus fi li over delta. If this is really confusing you, all I'm doing is playing with the minus signs, right? So you don't need to do that. Don't be terrified and don't say he's uh, pushing me too hard. The load is going down. The loft is going down. They agree it's positive. Bring it over to the other side, it's negative. You can do that. That's absolutely fine. We are not writing general purpose programs in this class. We are doing specific etudes to understand equilibrium and to do some cool parametric stuff. I will program it absolutely what I just said, unknown which is M cut, of course, and let's call it M cut uh, one is minus F two times loft two segment divided by Delta. Or I can use the negative one, and I could say it's the opposite of that. So I can say M cut two is the opposite of F one times loft uh, uh, V one. over delta, right? You could see I was hesitating like a chess master who uh, didn't know what he was doing. It's saying I messed up loft two. There it is. You can see uh, it's gray. I, I was blabbing and I, I didn't see it. So now it's blue. And um, 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 loft two segment is 
Off to two segments. Let's see here. M cut is that. Ah, uh, F2, sorry. I hope you saw that. Okay, very good. And then uh, as uh, since this is the modern Mueller Breslau method, uh, it's approaching the theoretical answer as uh, the delta gets small. Uh, don't worry about the theoretical answer if you are not a structural engineer. Do worry about the theoretical answer if you are a structural engineer or an architect or a construction manager. You should know that, um, okay? Mm, what else is necessary on our uh, presentation? Uh, there's a little bit more on the, the last slide. I think I could just go to the PowerPoint and uh, go to the last slide. So we did the perturbation, we found the loft both ways actually, here's with the segment. The other way is with just the difference of the Ys. Um, this is your final sort of uh, glamorous uh, presentation. I even put the four scale in there. I probably should take that out. I don't need the four scale here, but I like the lines in this one to demonstrate that, hey, the load point application point is swinging through an arc, right? So this is a pretty clean drawing. I even made the little dots consistent at the end of these. I labeled these as distance one and distance two. I put in some dynamic text that F1 is force per length times distance one. Remember, that's not what I just did. I, I programmed uh, F1 to be um, the PLF times the X of the cut minus the X of the load starting point. So I like this. This is really sweet. Uh, probably you could remove a few decimal places. That's under, um, uh, under the options. Uh, and then a large perturbation. Uh, if you know the theoretical answer, put it in. If you don't know, don't put it in. Or ask a civil engineer. Any civil engineer on planet Earth can get you that. And then for a small perturbation, you see that you are approaching the theoretical answer asymptotically. Isn't that a great word? <clears throat> okay, so once again, concentrated loads are the simplest to use in the modern Mueller Breslau method. When there's more than one, you just simply add everything up. Keep track of the signs. The signs are super important. If the sign of the force agrees with the sign of the loft, it's positive on the left side of the equation. Distributions of loads have to be made into equivalent point loads. If that distribution passes over a kink, you must break it up into two parts, one on either side of the kink and do so in proportion to how much load is there distributed on either side of the kink. Then strive for efficiency, economy, and elegance. The three E's from Princeton with my hero, David Billington. The three E's, strive for it in your scripts. Did you ever think about that? There's a clumsy way of writing a script and there's an elegant way of writing a script. Efficient. I don't have to be super efficient. These are not general purpose programs, but you want to be economical. These are great principles. When you make your final drawing, hide everything that you do not need. Every single little point, every single little mark that you don't need. Just show me the absolute minimum. Just the minimum amount. That's really what we do. Uh, you have 182'd, it's number 2-12. Draw the solutions, both coarse and fine. Make a single PDF. It's going to be great. Looking forward to seeing that work. I hope you're finding yourselves empowered by this programming. You can make beautiful drawings that look a little different than mine. That's fine. Choose your own style, but be consistent with line weight, be consistent with boundary conditions, with load icons. Your icons need to be consistent, otherwise they're not icons, they're just 
marks, right? An icon is a universally accepted symbol. All right, thanks again. Uh, so fun. I'm I, I'm loving it. I hope you are too.